Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. I'm taking a week off to fly the plane down to Grand Rapids and have my chemtrail equipment serviced. So in the meantime, please enjoy this remastered episode of Mark Sargent's Flat Earth Clues, Episode 7, Southern Flights. I was, and still am, a huge conspiracy guy. I literally ran out of new tin hat topics to research, and I still wouldn't look at this one without embarrassment. But every time I glanced at it, there was something unresolved. Well, hi everyone, and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. Today we're going to have a look at Mark Sargent's Flat Earth Clues Part 7. This is a particularly interesting one for me because it has to do with flight planning. This is of interest to me because I actually am a pilot. I'm formally trained in navigation and GPS. I also use and understand flight planning software, and I'll walk you through that. This clue looks into a topic I only glanced at in the original guide, which is the Southern Hemisphere, or in the Flat Earth model, the land masses closest to the outer ring. I like to give credit where credit is due, and the long haul title was given to me by a fellow flat earther who did some of the same research I did. The summary of the video is this. If you are looking to show someone how to view the flat earth from a practical point of view, this is the example I would use. I'm going to show you how strange the world looks using just a few websites, some simple math, a couple minutes, and your brain. I'll give you everything you need on screen and break down one of the examples as well. And I will do the same. I was going to use the official map of the Cat Earth Society, which is shown here, but it's not really a good map for navigation. So uh, there are a couple of things that I would like to point out that are strange on the world. The longest line of latitude is the equator, zero latitude. Now, above and below this, we have the Tropic of Cancer and we have the Tropic of Capricorn. On the flat Earth map, the Gleason projection, one is much longer than the other. However, on the actual Earth, both lines of latitude are exactly the same length, and both are shorter than the equator. This is exactly what you would expect on a sphere. I'll let you figure out how that works out on a Gleason map. If your favorite isn't listed here, like Google Maps, then use whatever is most familiar to you. Now, another point that is very telling is every one of those map and distance references that Mark gave you is based on the World Geodetic System 1984, which is a satellite-based mapping system using the world coordinate system that is accurate to within two centimeters on the surface of the Earth. So by using that system, Mark Sargent either is admitting he understands that the Earth is a sphere and that there are satellites in space, or he simply doesn't understand what he's talking about and didn't realize what he was doing. Now, the flight planning software that I'm going to be using is available to any of you. It's called skyvector.com, and it is possible on this software to plot a route between any two airports in the world. While this particular software is not certified for in-flight use, it does compare favorably to my for-flight application, which is certified for in-flight use and navigation. Unlike Mark, I'm not going to rely on commercial aviation routes. I'm going to be calculating direct flight routes and distances. Now, in addition to being able to accurately calculate distances between two points, if I plot a triangular course, I can accurately calculate each angle of that triangle. That will become important later. Now we are going to look at two specific groups of cities. The first group is going to be from the area around Australia, including New Zealand. We'll call this group one. The second group is going to be some cities in South America, all in the Southern Hemisphere. I mention this because if you go high enough, you will run into a few cities that won't work. Now, these two groups are interchangeable, as you would imagine, so you can start or end with either Group 1 or 2. The results will be the same, so you take anything from Group 1 and anything from Group 2, and you get some distances ranging from six to 8,000 miles, roughly. Noticing that the route is bent because they have to account for the curvature of the Earth. Now we're going to take a short break from Mark's story to actually learn something here. On a sphere, and only on a sphere, the shortest distance between two points in any direction is what is called a great circle course. The mere fact that the shortest distance between any two points on Earth 
is a great circle course, confirms that the Earth is a sphere. Now you're welcome to go onto the spherical math of this great circle course, but there's something important here for you to see. While Mark has already noted that these are curved paths, the radius of that curve can be important because in order to get the final distance on that course, you need to know the radius of the Earth. Conversely, if you already know the final distance of the path, you can calculate the radius of the Earth. That's a pretty neat trick, isn't it? All these directions are what you would expect, a straight shot over the South Pacific Ocean. Now, just to prove it's not an exclusive route, instead of starting in, say, Rio and landing in Auckland, I'll start what should be the opposite side, in Cape Town, South Africa, which is roughly the same distance on a globe Earth coming in at 7,300 miles. Notice on the map it's still a straight shot through the Indian Ocean and not crossing any countries. An easy route. Now in a shameless plug, I'd like to add that my friend Greater Sapien recently took a flight from Sydney, Australia to Cape Town, South Africa by this very route. I try to book my flight. For this example, we use travel math, but you can use whatever is easiest in your country, like Priceline, Expedia, Travelocity. It will make no difference because they're all tied to the same system. And this is when everything goes wrong. This is why if I want to find the shortest flight distance between any two points, I actually go to flight planning software and calculate the shortest flight between two points. Given the fact the question at hand is flight distance rather than commercial air route, I'm, I'm a little confused as to why Mark went to a travel site to do this instead of, uh, say, a flight planning site. I guess that's the difference between using somebody that actually knows something about navigation versus somebody that's trying to promote a narrative of a fantasy world. So the first leg, the airlines don't send me due east, but instead shoot me 4,700 miles almost due north to Dubai. Okay, maybe we're just picking up people. Seems a bit excessive, but I'll go with it. I'm probably comfortable in my seat drinking vodka tonics anyway. And from Dubai, it should be a straight shot home to Auckland, right? Er, no. Now they send me southeast to Melbourne a mere 7,300 miles. And then finally a third leg from Melbourne to Auckland coming in at around 1,600 miles. I'm rounding up or down to make the math easier. Regardless, the total miles for this flight is almost double what should be expected, coming in at 13,600 miles. In addition, the trip took me 37 hours. How long should it have taken? Well, in a triple seven, about 12. The first part of the clue is the utter lack of non-stop flights from anywhere in this hemisphere, which is why I gave you multiple cities why? in each group. You can't get a single non-stop flight, no matter how much money you pay. Except, of course, there's a couple right there. That took me all of five minutes to find on Qantas Airlines. It's a non-stop from Sydney, Australia to Cape Town, South Africa, and that happens to be the one the Greater Sapien took. There's actually a couple of dates that you can choose from, simply going to the Qantas website brings them right up. But even then, the strangeness doesn't end there, because the speed is wrong. 7,400 miles comes in at around 12 hours. Try to find this route. It doesn't exist. Except, of course, there it is. As you see, the correct cruising speed of a Boeing 777 is 482 knots. So, the arrival time is pretty much exactly as is on the ticket. It can't. The closest I came was a one-connection flight with a three-hour layover. The total flight time was 20 hours. 20, take away 3, is 17, not 12. Well, I guess that's the difference between knowing what you're doing and kind of sucking as a travel agent, Mark. Don't give up your day job. But this is all just numbers, right? It is until you pull up the flat Earth map and look at the farthest two points, which just coincidentally are anywhere in Australia and most of South America. Or my example of Lower Africa, which you can see isn't west at all. Well, Mark, cool story, bro, but here's one problem that you have. Don't you think people might notice that they're flying over ocean versus flying over land? Flights between your group one and group two, and flights between Australia and Africa are over the ocean. They're not over land. This isn't in question. If you were even remotely correct, You'd be flying over the North Pole. You're not. It's a shell game. And a very good one at that. Keep people guessing with multiple connections and layovers, jumping from city to city. People just sit in their seats 
trying to sleep through it. And then it hits you. Well, the pilots would know, right? They fly all day every day. Certainly, they would have figured it out by now. Yes, we have. Pilots like me, like Wolfie 6020, we know the Earth is a sphere. We know how to navigate. We keep telling you this, but you keep sputtering off on this same AE going over the North Pole to get to Africa from Australia nonsense. Why don't you admit the fact that we do know and we are telling you you just aren't listening. Seriously, Mark, this is a problem. It's called an argument from ignorance. You don't know the answer, yet you have a very strong opinion on what the answer must be. It doesn't work that way. But the truth of the matter is, Mark, you do know this, don't you? You're just promoting this because it gets you subscribers, and it makes you feel important to a lot of people who don't know this. This is Bob the Science Guy, signing out from Northern Michigan. Hey guys, take a moment, hit that little like and subscribe button down there. These videos are getting thousands of views and hundreds of likes. Let's see if we can bring those numbers a little closer to the number of views. All right? We'll see you again soon.